Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us online uh, this evening. Um, my, if you don't know me, because I know we will have some people watching who are not yet as familiar with the school as our current parents. My name is Elizabeth Stone. I'm the principal of Queenwood. Uh, and um, behind the scenes, I have a couple of colleagues who are uh, also here. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, give an overview of the HSC and the IB pathways at Queenwood uh, and then open it up to Q&A. Um, you will see in your uh, screen there's a, uh, an opportunity. It won't open up quite yet. I'll open it up towards the end. Um, and uh, to, you know we'll start fielding the questions as they come in. Um, and it's quite possible that I may be referring to my colleagues because on some technical details they're definitely better uh, than I am. Uh, what I'm going to do this evening is assume that you know, everyone listening in is reasonably unfamiliar with our system because uh, for some parents they feel reasonably confident with the HSC, um, but they don't really know enough about the IB. Uh, possibly if you've been overseas, you might feel very comfortable with the IB, but not yet with the HSC. Uh, and then we have people who are really familiar with neither credential. Um, we do a special process of preparation for our year 10 girls before they choose which pathway. And while you know you may be a year 10 parent or a year nine parent who's looking ahead for, for next year, um, I'm not particularly pitching it at any family that's making a decision uh, or considering these decisions anytime soon. Quite often we have parents of, of children who are quite young who say, I just, I don't understand what the talk is about. I'd like to have an overview. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And um, I'm going to cover, let me just send the, the slides over now. I should be appearing in the corner uh, in a minute. Um, so we're going to uh, go through uh, why do we offer two pathways? How do the HSC and the IB work? Uh, how to choose between them? How do we measure success and higher education entrance and then into the Q&A? All right, so why do we offer two pathways? Well, First and foremost, it gives choice to the girls. So as we'll see as we run you through the two pathways, uh, they do have different characteristics. They will appear, appeal in different ways to different students. And we think it's wonderful to have uh, both of those pathways open to girls, allow them to choose. Um, it also fits in with our ethos of engaging with different perspectives. Now, obviously, the IB is an international credential, and so its curriculum is not specific to any particular nation, uh, and that allows great freedom and great breadth in that. But remember that all of our teachers teach both pathways. They teach both HSC and IB. So in fact, that broadening of perspective through the teachers comes into the school for the benefit of all of the girls. Um, so we see it as very much, we talk about uh, offering a liberal education and having an expansive perspective on the world and that being very much part of our vision for education at Queenwood. And it fits very well with that. They are two mutually enriching curricula. I mean, I'm a maths teacher of all things and I know even maths which you would think is um, less uh, susceptible to um, you know, national variation than almost any other subject. But I can tell you when I went over to the UK and was teaching over there, often the, there would be a slightly different slant on the same thing. So you would, you would approach questions in slightly different ways. If it can do that in maths, how much more in all of the other areas? So we really do see uh, that the teachers enriching their knowledge and uh, the flow on effects through that. So, so by having them both in the school, there's benefit for all of the girls, even though each individual girl will only choose one pathway. And it keeps us connected to an international education community. And, you know, we, we want, um, you know, again, to be plugged into what's going on out there. It's wonderful for our students, but it's also a very good uh, offer for our uh, colleagues as our staff because they get to enrich their knowledge and their professional development uh, and it's a good incentive for recruitment. So there's lots of great reasons why we do that. Okay, so now into the nitty gritty of how do the HSC and the IB work? So let me just run you through um, the basics of, of um, the HSC and how it is structured, first of all. So the first thing to know is that there's a body called NESA, the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, uh, and they set the curriculum for the HSC. 
Um, each subject is divided into a year 11 course, which is called the preliminary course. That comes to a close at the end of term three of year 11. And then the HSC course is the year 12 course. English is compulsory. And then the rest of it is free choice. As we'll see when we go through the IB, that's quite different. The only compulsory subject in the HSC is English. And subjects are divided up into units. So on the whole, look, there are a couple of exceptions, but we don't do this. So I'll just put bluntly, each subject is worth two units. And you have to do a minimum of 10 units to get to the to get an HSC, a higher school certificate. To get that certificate, you have to do 10, two of which must be English. You have to do a minimum of 12 units for year 11. And we encourage the girls to do 11 or more at year 12. Um, there is a strong temptation amongst the girls to say it's best if I concentrate my efforts on just 10 units. Um, but we tend to find that the best results come from the girls who do uh, 11 or more. Now, there are extension courses and they're not in all subjects, but they're an additional course in that particular subject and they have separate content and separate assessment and separate exams. So, for instance, if I'm doing extension maths, I would do the normal maths subject and then I would do another maths course on top of it called extension. Um, and they, they count for one unit. In English and maths, you can do this extra one unit course in years, in year, uh, years 11 and 12. Most of the one unit courses, the extension courses, are in year 12 only. So languages, history, music and science offer extension, but only in year 12. Now, there are only in English and in maths, there's also extension two, so another additional unit. So you could do up to four units in maths and English, up to three units in languages, history, music and science, and two units in everything else. Um, we strongly recommend that the girls do at least one extension course in year 12. We find that, uh, and I can explain more on that if you, you need it, um, but there are, it, it, it's clear that the process of working um, so if you think about it, you know, if, if the two unit course is this big and then the third unit pushes you up to this higher level, it tends to consolidate and improve your understanding of the two unit course. And we do see statistically big benefits for the girls. So let me just give you a sense of how this sort of, I don't know, the Lego pieces fit together with this. So um, this is an example of what a, a year 11 um, program of study might look like. So they're doing advanced English and there's also a standard English course for two units, but obviously the advanced one is a bit more advanced. Um, this uh, student is doing maths extension one, so that's three units. They're doing modern history, French, chemistry, geography for a total of 13 units. Now, when they get to the end of year 11, they have some choices in those three subjects that are highlighted in red. Um, with maths, they could go up to four units to extension two. They could go down. They could drop maths altogether, potentially, if they have enough units le left. In modern history, they could choose to go up and add an extra unit of history, or they could go down and just drop history. And in French, they could add a unit or drop it. And they can, in fact, drop anything except for English. OK, so. I'm making this up. This is just a, a hypothetical student. So this student might choose if they wished to drop history and take on French extension and do 12 units. That would be a not unusual pattern. They could have dropped French and taken history extension. OK, but you see how it works. Another example might be a student who's doing a standard English and standard maths. So not advanced English and not advanced maths, visual arts, French biology and business studies. Now, in this case, the only choice they have to make about any extension would be in French. There are no, um, uh, oh, actually, they, they could possibly do science, science extension. Sorry, I forgot to highlight that one. So they would have those choices there, but they wouldn't have the choices of extension subjects in English and maths. Um, and when they come, I mean, again, I've just sort of, you know, hypothetically said, OK, well, this student might choose to drop maths. I'm a maths teacher. I wouldn't necessarily advise that, um, but they could and choose to do French extension instead. Or they could just keep going with 12 units. OK, so they don't have to make any choices up or down. So I hope that's clear for how the, um, the HSC works. 
OK, how do IB subjects fit together? Here are the basics. So first of all, it is explicitly a generalist credential. Each pupil must do six subjects and they do a two year course and the exams at the end cover all of the material. Okay, whereas the HSC very clearly divides into the preliminary and the HSC course, the so year 11 and 12 bit. The IB is a two year course with the exams covering the full two years at the end. They must do English and there are different levels and types, but they have to do English. They have to do a language. They have to do a humanities, a science. They have to do maths at some level. Then in the sixth category, they can do the arts or free choice. So they might do an additional language or a second science or a second humanities. OK, they also must do creativity activity service, which is um, an additional uh, program which reflects the interest of the IB in developing the whole person and saying you need to be out there doing creative things, you need to do group projects, you need to be physically active, you need to be making a contribution to the community. So they have to do a certain number of hours and log them and so on and come up with projects. They also do an extended essay. Um, the extended essay is 4,000 words. They have to do, probably the most challenging part of it is not the length, but developing the question. I remember when I went to university, um, the first time I was not given a question to answer, but actually had to develop one. That was a real challenge for me. I was, um, uh, you know, you have to do a whole lot of research around the topic in order to be able to, um, uh, define the question well and so it's quite a challenge for them also by the way one of the things that sets them up very well uh, when they go to university and they're doing that uh, they've seen it before um, so they do the extended essay uh, and then they do theory of knowledge which is a uh, essentially a sort of a half course that they do which is on um, if you've done any philosophy it's sort of epistemology how do we know what we know what are the different ways of reasoning if we say something has been historically proven, is that different from scientifically proven? Answer yes. You know, how do we know things? How do we argue things? Um, moral reasoning, ethical reasoning. It's a it's a beautiful course. Um, now, the other thing is just as the HSC has extension courses, uh, the IB has either standard level SL or higher level subjects. And the difference is not so much in the content, but in the depth to which they have to know it. And that's reflected in the mandatory hours um, that are prescribed for that. Um, most, but not all subjects are offered at higher level and we'll explore that in a minute. Students must take three subjects at higher level. So they get to, they start everything all together and then, um, uh, then when they're a couple of terms in, they have to nominate which ones they're going to do at higher level. So let's have a look. Here's an example program that this student is doing English language and literature, that's the English course they've chosen, French geography, physics, maths, visual arts, TOC and CAS, theory of knowledge and creativity activity service. Now they have some choices to make when it comes to choosing their HL subjects because all of six of these courses have a higher level option. And so they're going to choose presumably their, you know, their best three, that would be the, the normal process. And this student may say, well, actually, I'd like to do geography, physics and visual arts at a higher level. And of course, in year 12, we add the extended essay as well. All right, so that that's how it might look. But there's a difference between that student who had six choices and this one who has chosen English literature, Spanish ab initio, that's a beginner's course, economics, biology, a, a different um, and slightly less advanced maths course uh, and Latin because in this case they only have four subjects which have an, an HL, a higher level option. And then they really need to choose carefully. Um, and the, the reasons are, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of this tonight, but um, the, the IB criteria are quite stringent because it's not only that you have to pass your courses, but you have to pass your higher level courses at a certain level. And so it's theoretically possible and very occasionally we get examples of this where overall the, the student scores are adding up to a reasonably healthy total, but they haven't done well enough in their higher level courses to meet the criteria and that's a real problem. Um, so you really need to think carefully right at the beginning, this student here has many more choices available to them 
than rather than this one, because if you had two subjects which weren't going so well out of those four red ones, all of a sudden you're in trouble because you're nominating one to be harder, more advanced and to count for extra. So in this case, this student has chosen uh, English um, literature, uh, economics and biology. And then, of course, we add the EE. All right. Um, now, HSC assessment. Right. Buckle up. <laughs> um, actually, no, the buckle up bit, will get, this bit's not so bad. It's, it's the one after, but the assessment does, does get complicated. So in year 11, you do the preliminary course in terms one to three, and it's a mixture of formal and informal assessments. You are permitted, or the school is permitted by NESA, to uh, implement only three formal assessments per subject. Um, Look, to be honest, the difference between an informal and a formal assessment is really just how it feels to the kids. Um, you know, there are certain procedures we follow about notifications and what appears in their end of term report when we send it home to you and so on. But in essence, nothing sort of counts for the final result. Um, so uh, they, they have year 11. They need to be working pretty hard, but they do have a bit of flex there to um, make some mistakes and it, it won't, won't count. In year 12, remember it's four terms, but it's really starting in this term, the fourth term of their year 11, going through to the end of term three of year 12. That's the HSC course. And all of their, their final result is based on what happens in year 12, with 50% of that being what happened with their uh, exams and 50% being school-based assessment. Now, again, there's a maximum of four assessment tasks, and by that we mean the ones that count for your HSC, the ones that contribute towards that 50% of your final results, which counts. Um, we can only administer a maximum of four assessment tasks with varied weightings, depending on what the assessment is and where we are in the year. And you add those up with the, you know, the appropriate weighting, and that becomes your assessment mark. So, for example, if you are doing six courses, which would be fairly standard for um, uh, the HSC, and you have four assessment tasks, then that means in the course of the year you're doing 24 tasks in 38 weeks. So it is pretty taxing, um, and there is uh, they really need to be, um, you know, able to sustain the rhythm. And a, a very bad habit is to say, oh, my goodness, my next assessment in five days is, I don't know, maths. I'm going to drop everything and just do maths for the next five days, because you can see these these things are coming in at the rate of, you know, I mean, in theory, it might be sort of one every 10 days or so. But actually, because you don't really do many assessments right at the beginning of the term, they tend to be even more concentrated. So they really and, and every single one of these tasks counts. Um, so they really need to be on top of their game and they need to be just relentlessly focused throughout year 12. Now, at the end of it, they get this is what a, a high school certificate, the actual certificate looks like. And if we take a closer look, this is a very ugly picture. I apologise for it, but I, I don't know. It looks like it was designed in the 1990s by um, the NESA predecessor, which was called BOSTES. But it's still this is still how it's done. And it's the only um, uh, diagram they still have available. But anyway, it's clear enough. You have the examination mark here in the yellow column. I hope you can see my cursor. You have your assessment mark here. Um, if it's two units, they're giving you a mark out of 100. If it's one unit, they're giving you a mark out of 50. So each unit counts for 50 points. Um, then they take the average. So the average of 81 and 85 is 83. Um, the average of 84 and 90 is 87. So you can see 50%, 50%, they average them. That's your final HSC mark. And they also give you a performance band. And I think probably the easiest way to think of what a band is, is to think of it like a grade. So the highest band is six. And think of that maybe like an A grade, okay? Then a five. And then the extension courses, the grades go up to E4, and that would be the highest um, band. All right, so now, <laughs> now we're getting into the long grass about how results and assessment work. I did say buckle up before. Look, if you want to just pour yourself a glass of something right at this point, tune back in in about seven or eight minutes, I completely understand. But the reason I go into this aspect of it in some detail um, is um, that the... Um, uh, 
that is, is because there are so many misconceptions about it. And there's a lot of sort of urban myth about what's happening um, with, with HSC assessments and so on and the effect of things. So, you know, I really do, you know, the reason I go into detail is to try and clear some of those up. Um, okay, so here's the framework for the results. There are two, two basic approaches in education generally. One is norm reference. You just go, okay, here's a bell curve of results. The top 10% gets an A and then the next, I don't know, 18% gets a B and you just do it and it's all comparative. So it's telling you nothing about how highly performing that particular cohort is, but it is telling you your place in relation to them. The other approach is criterion reference, which is if you can do this, that means you are an A standard. If you can do that, you are a B standard. All right. And the HSC uses criterion referenced assessment. You need to remember that for the bit that I'm about to show you. So, OK, this is the buckle up bit. OK, the school calculates the raw assessment mark. So we say we, you've done four assessment. This was worth 30 percent. That was worth you know, 45 percent. We add that all up and we've got a raw assessment mark. OK, so we we have a raw assessment mark for each girl and then we have a problem because if a girl at Queenwood gets 80 percent and a girl at another school gets gets 80 percent, are they the same? What if what if we were giving much easier tests or much harder tests than another school? How could you possibly compare those? So the answer is to use the exam marks as your benchmark. Because everyone sits the same exam and then we'll say, oh, well, look, school A was sitting here and school B was sitting here. So we can presume that 80 percent at this school is going to be higher by this much than 80 percent at that school. All right. So everything is anchored on the exam results. Um, and that causes problems if the girls go off the boil for exams, but we'll get to that bit later. OK, so the raw assessment marks are moderated against the raw exam marks. OK, how do, what does that mean? So again, if you're just thinking of like a spread of marks, let's say we've got the mean um, somewhere in the middle um, and we've got the top and we've got the bottom. So what you do is you say, OK, for this particular school, this is what they got in the assessment and this is what they got in the exam. We're now going to take the mean for the assessment and the mean for exam and we'll match them up. And let's say the assessment marks were lower all of the, the mean will be brought up to that. So now we know, I don't know, the assessment mark was, the mean was 63 and the exam, the mean was 74. That mean goes up for their assessments now by 11%. Then they match the top mark and the bottom mark. And then you end up with them moderated against the exam. So here's a little diagram where we've got the mean here in the middle, that's student C, student A, student B, in, that's the top mark, the bottom mark. Notice that they are not matching individual student performance, they're matching the cohort. So let's say this is how they did in the exam. So these two students here actually swapped over. The top mark went up, but it was a different student. OK, what are they going to do with the raw assessment? OK, and the, the, the mean went down. OK, here, let's say the, the mean in the exam was 84 the mean in the assessment gets pulled up. This means C's mark gets pulled up, but it's nothing to do with how C went because they actually did a little bit worse, all right? It's because they were on the mean. So this is taking to, into account that individual performances vary, but cohorts vary much less than individuals. Then we say, what's the top mark? Okay, student A who had the top assessment mark, they now get the benefit of the top exam mark being higher, even though it wasn't their mark. Student E, is the bottom in both of them, but their their assessment mark will be pulled up now to the, meet the level of the exam. So there's a serious incentive for students to keep working right up into the exams because the better they can do in the exams, the more growth they can have between when the assessment finishes and the exams, the, they will not only get the benefit of stronger exam marks, but they'll bring all of their assessment marks up with them. There's a real incentive to do that. All right. Then, so that's only the first process, all right? That was the moderation, the adjustment of the assessment marks in the school against that same school's marks uh, it, performance in the exam. Okay, now they have to determine the grade boundaries. And they, to do this, they examine the grade descriptors. So I don't know, maybe um, you can see here on the screen, I'll uh, zoom in in a second, but you can see we talked about bands being A grade. So this is like the A grade, okay? And it's always set as between 90 and 100. 
band five will be between 80 and 90 and so on. And look at the differences in the wording. So these are descriptions, descriptors for advanced English. Um, and oops, sorry, wrong direction. There we go. OK, band six says, so I'm just pulling this language off here, OK, and here. So band six says, you know, when we're looking at this student's exam, we will look to whether they demonstrated extensive, detailed knowledge, insightful understanding, sophisticated evaluation, but band five, uh, and whether they present a critical and refined personal response showing highly developed skills in, etc. Band five would be not extensive detail, but merely detailed. Insightful understanding, band five is perceptive. This is sophisticated, this is effective. You can feel it's just one rung down, okay? Presents a critical personal response, but not necessarily refined, rather than highly developed, it's well developed, okay? And, and so on down the, the grades, these are descriptors. Now, a lot of people are sort of quite surprised in a way that it comes down so much to judgment. Um, but that's what you get when you get criterion referenced assessments, because what you're saying is this level of achievement is equivalent to an A or a B or a C. OK, so you have to make those judgments. So the first thing they do is they determine the grade boundaries because they'll have, um, uh, you know, a whole lot of um, scores and some of them will be clearly us like that's definitely an A, that's definitely band six. But what they really need to do is look at the boundaries where it's like, oh, it's either the bottom end of a A or maybe it's the top end of a B. OK, that's where the judges, um, they're the experts, come in and they sit around and they have uh, big meetings and talk about things and they compare scripts and so on and they set the boundaries. So what they might say is, look, we think having looked at, you know, this set of papers and we've talked it through, what we think is if you got a 79 percent on this year's particular exam, then you are demonstrating that, you know, highly detailed, perceptive, well-developed, whatever it is, okay? And therefore, the cutoff now for a band six will be 79%, or the cutoff for an A is now 79%. It, and next year, it might be different because the exam might be different. It might be a little bit easier, and maybe the, bound, the grade boundary is 83%, or maybe it's really hard and it's 68%. OK, but that's how they're doing it. So what they then do is they adjust all of those exam marks. So you might have got 79 percent in the exam and they'll say, oh, well done, that's a band six. And as we saw on that first diagram, if I can show you band six, the bottom end of a band six is a 90. So your 79 percent, because it matches these descriptors, now becomes a 90. All right, so the mark that you get in your HSC exam that actually gets released you has no, no relationship whatsoever to the number on the, that was given to you by the person who marked your script. OK, so then they align all of the raw exam scores, pulling, you know, if this is the grade boundary up or down. And then, OK, so here we go. This is the whole process. You have the school assessment marks. You have the exam marks. OK, you moderate the assessment marks against the exam performance. So they go through that process. Now we have the school assessment marks and the exam marks to the same standard. And then you match them against, well, what do we say a band six of grade A is? Right, now we'll adjust them again. That's the scaling part. And then you get your HSC results with your exam, your assessment marks, which have been moderated and scaled and your exam marks, which have been scaled. And that's how you get this thing. All right. If you followed this, well done. I'm so glad you're still with me. Okay. All right. So that's what hopefully now that makes sense to you. You've got your assessment mark, what you did in school, and your assessment mark, that number will be have very little relationship to the number that you was on your your particular assessment tasks. You have your exam mark, which is another number which also bears very little resemblance to any number that appeared on when they marked your script. It's all pulled up and massaged against those grade descriptors. Then that's translated back into marks. It's average and that's your HSC mark and there's your performance band. OK, I hope that that makes sense. All right. Now, the other requirement is that there's a literacy and numeracy test. Um, in principle, I have issues about this. If they're all doing English, why not? Um, and by the way, maths is becoming compulsory from 2026. So we've still got a few cohorts going through in the HSC who don't have to do maths, but soon that will, will is, well, it may, they're talking about it being compulsory. I'm not entirely sure it will go through, um, not least because there's a shortage of maths teachers. But anyway, we stay tuned on that. Um, in the meantime, they're also making students do a literacy and numeracy test. 
Look, in our context, it's not particularly relevant. Our girls do it in uh, year 10, they get it out of the way. Occasionally they have to have more than one attempt, but they have they have not only to the end of year 12 to do it, but actually till three years after they leave school. It, it's a non-issue. It only affects whether you get the physical certificate. It does not affect your ATAR or whether you get into university. Uh, it just, I'm not spending any more time on it. It's a, it's a nothing. All right, so there you go. Then you get your higher school certificate. Um, and that's that's HSC marking an assessment for you. OK, the IB will be simpler, partly because we've done some of the hard stuff, partly because it is just simpler. All right, the IB is also criterion reference, so it's about what you can do. Two year course, as we said, all of the topics over those two years can be examined, not just the ones in the year 12 HSC course. Um, they give grades from one to seven, with seven being the highest. So if you do six subjects, you get six subjects with a grade of seven. So this gives you your six times seven points. And then there's three bonus points reflecting your performance in theory of knowledge and extended essay. Uh, and if you get all of those points, you would get a maximum of 45. OK, now the grades are awarded against grade descriptors. So the markers, they're doing their marking and just like the HSC um, process, they assess it against the criterion reference. This is an example from IB and you can see the language is very, very similar. OK, so a grade seven demonstrates excellent understanding and appreciation of the interplay. Here it's very good understanding and appreciation. All right. Um, responses that may be convincing, detailed, independent in analysis that are mainly convincing, as well as detailed and independent to some degree. All right, so you can just see those are the descriptors. So that that's how they mark it. All right, so you get your points uh, for each subject. You add them up. That's it. You just get a number. Now, the number gets translated into an ATAR, um, and I'll come to that shortly. The assessment process varies by course, but overall it is much more heavily based on the final exam, which is typically between 60 and 80 percent. Um, the internal assessment is marked by their teacher and then moderated by the IB. It's typically um, uh, around 20 percent. If it's externally by, marked by the IB, it's typically around 20 percent. So it just depends on the subject, but you get some feel. It's, it is much heavier on the exam content. The assessments usually begin late in year 11 uh, and then the, the last of them are due in uh, August of year 12, typically one or two assessment tasks per course. So compared to, you know, 24 things that count in 38 weeks for the HSC, um, they're probably doing 12 in total and they count for much less. So actually, um, you know, there, there's there are swings and roundabouts on this. Um, the the if you are a student who is not very good at self-regulation, is prone to procrastination and delay and kind of ignoring the fact that things are mounting up, the IB can be a real problem because um, it's so heavily weighted at the end and you can kind of ignore um, the, the things, you know, it's not, you know, it, that it's getting serious um, for too long and dig yourself a very big hole. The HSC can be overwhelming in just the, the, the frequency of those assessments that count. But on the other hand, it focuses the mind. Um, so if you've got a, a student who is not good at um, self-regulation, we would definitely and strongly be recommending and very occasionally requiring the HSC rather than the IB. Um, and again, one of the things that comes up is that if you you know, really stuff things up in the HSC, the result is you will get a very low mark, but you will still get the HSC, you will still get an ATAR, you still have some options open to you. If you don't meet the requirements of the IB, they simply will not grant you the diploma. And then you've done two years and you've got nothing. You can't get an ATAR. And then your only option for university entry is some sort of early entry thing if they're prepared to overlook it. Um, but a whole lot of doors close and it's a very scary place to be. Um, so we, we, we don't really want to take risks with that. And if we think there's a student who's not mature enough to be managing themselves, we would um, certainly be directing them away from the IB for that reason. Um, OK, so. How do the HSC and the IB compare for higher education? Well, again, there are some preconceptions around this. So the ATARS, if you're new to Australia, um, you may not know that it stays, stands for the Australian Tertiary Admission Rank, uh, and it's produced by the University's Admission Centre uh, for students across Australia. 
Now it's really simple for the IB diploma because you just match a number. If you got a 42, you got a 98.85. And the ATAR is a percentile. So if you've got a, an ATAR of 85, what it's saying is you're in the 85th percentile. In other words, you performed higher than 85% of this cohort. All right, so it's just a very clear, it's just a ranking. Where do you sit in this whole cohort? You know, if you've got 70, you're doing better than 70%. If you've got 99, you're doing better than 99%. Now, the ATAR conversion for the IB is fixed in advance. These are the scores for 2022. There are a few nuances which are new. Um, the, the students themselves will only be given whole numbers. But in fact, for this year, for the first time, the IB will be awarding uh, marks in 0.25 increments. So actually, they will be communicating with UAC and saying, well, it wasn't a 42, it was a 42.75. Um, and that will be translated. And in fact, I've given you the simplified version. They actually have a, you know, a tariff for 42.75 is this rank, but this gives you the sense of it. Um, and um, so it's a relatively straightforward process there. But notice that, you know, you could get, let's say, 24, which is an ATAR of 68.85. Um, and that's doing better than 68.85% of students in New South Wales. But you could still fail the diploma in the sense that you didn't get of your 24 points, not enough of them were in higher level subjects. So even though you got a mark which could lead to some pathways, if you did the IB diploma and somehow those marks weren't distributed correctly and you hadn't met the criteria, you could actually be locked out from that. Um, so just keep bearing that in mind. Um, how do girls choose um, the, um, sorry, so, what, sorry, what I should say about the um, uh, HSC rankings. Um, the way that they uh, do it is they go back to um, the, raw, sorry, the scaled, let me get it right. They go back to the uh, raw exam marks and then the moderated assessment marks. So before they've been adjusted up to meet the descriptions uh, and they compare how those cohorts have done as a whole. So what they, they take into account, they say, okay, look, we know that some programs are more competitive than others. For instance, um, the, um, higher level um, maths courses are going to be harder clearly than the lowest level of maths courses. And yet in the HSC, they will both award a band six. Yay, you know, and so it should. I mean, I think any conscientious student who's doing what they're asked should be able to get an A. That, that's a good sort of principle. But it, of course, makes sense that it's not a fair comparison to say, oh, congratulations, you got 90% in a really hard course and you got a 90% in a much less demanding course and treat them the same. And so what they're looking at is um, how does the cohort that does you know, four unit maths, that's extension two maths, how does that compare to the ones doing the lowest level? And then they adjust them in relation to that. And that adjustment all happens through phenomenally powerful and complex statistical analysis behind the scenes. And then they are ranked. Uh, and so they take into account not just how they did in maths courses. What they say is every student who was doing this maths course, how did they do in the other courses? And then they get all of those overlaps because some of them will both be doing French or they'll both be doing biology. And they start to get a pretty powerful picture because of the number of students involved about how those cohorts compare in strength. And then they adjust them. Anyway, I can do more on that if you need it. But there we go. So how do girls choose between the HSC and the IB? Well. We do multiple information sessions in year 10. Uh, we get expressions of interest from the girls about what they're likely to want to do in term two. Um, then we give them a whole lot of expert advice based on you know, what they're saying they want to do and what we, uh, we know of their, um, their academic profile and the way that they learn. Um, then we uh, do one of the, the sort of the, the late stages is we do individual interviews between the girl and her parents and senior staff. And then we say, right, now you've got to fix it because we've got to develop a timetable. And then we go into the timetable um, and uh, we try and reduce the number of clashes down to a bare minimum. I would say typically out of 100 students, we might end up with, I guess so typically there might be three to five students where we say, oh, these, these two aren't going to work. 
you know, I know you want to do ancient history, would you consider modern history instead, something like that. Um, and then we lock those in uh, and then we know what we're doing. Now, if after that point, when we've already settled the timetable and how that's going to work, if a girl came along and said, well, you know, I've, I've re rethought things, I'd like to do this instead now, if it fits, we're more than happy to change that. Um, but at some point we have to stop rearranging the timetable around the girls so that we can actually um, write the timetable, get the staffing in place and plan for the coming year. All right, now, we are led by the girls and their interests and needs. We are not aiming for some 50-50 split or nor are we aiming to, um, you know, sort of have a predominance of, of um, IB. The current trend seems to be that but somewhere between a quarter and a third of girls um, tend to choose the IB and with the remainder doing HSC. We are very happy with the numbers being around that. Um, we don't you know, have any sort of particular um, uh, you know, goal that it should be uh, in any given year. And it does fluctuate. Um, so sometimes we, we you know, might get as high as um, a third and then sometimes it'll drop right back. But it seems to be um, reasonably predictably between a quarter and a third of the cohort choosing the IB. The course offerings do tend to change from year to year, and that is partly according to the interest of the cohort. Um, so, for instance, you know, we had some girls approach us about a particular, you know, earth and environment course and we introduced that. But actually what we found is um, over time they just developed a much stronger interest in geography and the geography numbers went through the roof and there was really no one left doing that. So we said, OK, that's that's good. You've voted with your feet now. We'll do geography. Um, there is some differentiation between subjects in each pathway. For instance, uh, drama is something that we offer in uh, the HSC and not the IB, but all the basics are covered um, in both courses. So for most girls, if they are considering the IB, they're probably all rounders anyway. It doesn't appeal to specialists because you have to do a bit of everything um, and they generally have no problem constructing a program. Now, one of the assumptions can be that if you want to uh, study overseas, that you really need to do the IB because that's the one that prepares you uh, and is accepted overseas. That is not true. We have a lot of experience with getting girls into universities all over the place with the HSC. I, I will say, yes, sometimes it's a slightly simpler conversation with some universities when you first start because they're very familiar with the IB. Um, but actually, they're pretty familiar with the HSC as well. So um, it's a well-trodden path. We are very comfortable with that. And I would strongly recommend anyone doing the IB simply because that's what you have to do. Excuse me while I take a sip. So how do we measure success? Well, first of all, we measure success in how well our girls are doing. It's not by their marks. Um, and, and we need to keep that you know, at the forefront. We are a school which is educating a girl for life. We want to be her to be a fully developed, mature human being. Uh, and it's just not good enough to, um, you know, flog them and abandon everything else in the pursuit of marks. That said, um, the there's no doubt that examination success matters. It's the gateway um, for the next thing. And so, you know, we, we, we have to pay attention and we do. Um, so here are the questions that we're asking. You know, it's successful if it gets them where they need to go. It's successful if it prepares them for further study. So when they get there, they can thrive. And did the whole process of preparation for the exams educate them well? That is our measure, even of exam success. All right. That said, I know you'll be um, interested in the numbers. If you are comparing the numbers, please bear in mind that ATARs are more reliable. Why are they more reliable? Because as I explained earlier, they are the only measure which takes into account the relative difficulty of subjects and the difference in cohorts. So it's really interesting to me that the, um, the statistics which are used to construct league tables in the newspapers and so on, they would rate an A in the highest maths course and an A in the lowest maths course exactly the same. So if we were a school that wanted to game those tables, what would you do? You would push able students into unsuitably easy courses in order to maximise your A grades and we would look fantastic um, and that would be absolutely at the expense of the girls' education. 
Um, so those tables just irritate me no end. They are inaccurate and misleading. If you're going to compare things, you really need to look at the ATARs. And we are very proud of our results. They are very strong. So here's the last two years. Uh, last year, 9% of our students, 9% were in the top 1% of the state. The year before, it was 12% in the top 1%. OK, we have we're going between a quarter and a third of our cohort getting in the top five percent of the state. I mean, that is such a strong performance. All right, and they're, they're the statistics in the top 10 percent and the top 20 percent. All right, so they are performing at a really high level, but we just want to keep the girls at the forefront of that. And so, you know, just if, if you are looking around for comparisons, you really should be looking at the ATARs. We offer demanding courses and we push the girls into the highest courses of which they are capable. And that is reflected here, but not in some of the other measures. There is a bit of a myth that um, the only way to do well in a, in a school that offers two pathways is to do the IB. Uh, and that is a myth. So if you just look at the top 15 students last year, um, the top 15 in the IB got 98.6, the top 15 in the HSC got 96.5. Very, very similar. The year before, the top 20 students, 95, 93. I mean, it's very, very similar. The year before, even closer. All right, so the, it doesn't matter which course you do, you can do equally, equally well in the HSC and the IB. All right, so as we get towards the end, I should I'll just flick through and open up the Q&A so you can start typing if you need while I finish it. Um, there we go. So I'm just opening, pressing the button on that to open it up. Um, the key points. We offer the HSC and the IB because it enriches the education for all of the girls. And, and just if you hear the myth that the best teachers teach one course and not the other, it is a myth. All of our teachers teach both HSC and IB, not necessarily in the same year, but they might do the IB for a couple of years, the HSC. There is no division like that. Um, we have no sort of agenda to increase or decrease the proportions. We're really allowing the girls to determine their own interests. They have different structures and courses which are going to suit different styles of study. Both pathways are suitable for overseas study. The league tables are misleading and the ATARs are the more relevant measure, but early entry is now skewing results significantly. So do you remember what we were saying earlier about um, it with the HSC, for instance, that you know you get your assessment marks and if they're here, if you can keep working and pull, you know, and not just one girl, but you need the whole cohort to pull their exam marks up between assessment and exam, they get not just the benefit of the exam, but they pull their assessment marks up as well. What we are finding, and I mean, I've talked to lots of heads, this is a phenomenon now that we're all grappling with. Um, the the um, overwhelmingly dominant pathway until very recently was that you would do your exams, get your HSC, get your ATAR, and then apply for your courses with your ATAR. Um, what has happened is um, it started off as just a, a ferocious fight amongst the universities to get the best students. Uh, and they started to say, oh, well, we can tell how they're going to do in once we have their year 11 results. You know, we can go, here's their year 11 results. Then we, we look, you know, we make an offer to them. And then we can look with hindsight and see how they did in year 12 and go, yeah, we were right. Um, the problem is um, when the conditions change, so does the behaviours. And so a lot of schools are saying we are having trouble with students who get early entry because they're sitting pretty. They've got an, an offer before they do their exams. They no longer have to study. The, many of these offers are unconditional. And that starts to um, take their minds away from the study. Uh, and that has an impact on their overall exam, which will... Um, may not affect them, but would affect their cohort. Um, that's not specific to Queenwood. That's just a, a new issue that we're getting in the HSC, but something to be aware of. All right, so um, we've opened up the Q&A um, and um, let's have a look at them. Um, and by the way, I've got colleagues online um, behind the scenes here. Um, and um, oh, I'm going to get uh, Miss Eggleton, who is our 
um, uh, careers advisor to answer this one because she's going to give you a much more detailed answer than me. Oh, hang on. So, Ms. Eggleton, I'm just about to throw you on screen because there's two questions which have come through essentially the same. Oh, hang on. I've got to stop sharing my screen. Apologies. Um, there are two which have come through which are essentially the same, which is what is the best pathway for medicine? Over to you. Do you mind answering that for us? Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, either. Um, you're on mute. Can you hear? Oh. Am I still on mute? No, it's not coming through, Julie. I'm, I've taken myself off mute. Oh. Uh, possibly on the top right of your screen, maybe? No? Oh. OK. Um, well, how about um, you can you can see the Q&A and you can actually type a reply. Um, and I'll move on to some of the other ones because um, I'd like you to answer that. Um, the um, does Queen would offer legal studies? No, we don't. Uh, any other questions coming through? What else have we got? How are you going with the mute, Julie? No. OK, well, I should put myself back on screen at least. Um, so I think I think my colleague is going to say that there is no preference for HSC and IB. Yeah, she's giving me the thumbs up. Um, and just bear in mind that in most universities in Australia, the entrance pathway is the ATAR and they're going to get an ATAR no matter whether they do the HSC or the IB. Now, I think, Julie, I'd love to um, uh, um, get your thoughts on it, but um, the uh, oh, a few comments are coming through saying they can hear you. How oh. odd that I can't hear you. OK, Julie, do you want to go? And I'm going to assume that everyone can. Do you want to answer this one? Uh, yes. So there would be no advantage doing one program over the other. Also, if you do apply for undergraduate medicine, that is straight from school into the pathway where you incorporate the postgraduate fully um, qualified to be a practicing doctor after many years. There are a number of uh, stages that most universities take into consideration, look at, uh, including the UC UCAT, which is an exam students sit in July of year 12. They look, um, if you do well in that, you then may be invited to attend an interview. And if you do well in that, you then still have to get a very high um, ATAR, which you can get from either program. OK, is it over to me, Julia? I, funnily enough, I can't hear you. All right, well, I'm coming back to you. <laughs> so I'm trusting that everyone heard you. Fantastic. Uh, I'm just looking for any more questions. Um, not seeing too much coming through. That's a good sign. Maybe we, um, uh, maybe we dealt with them all. OK, gosh. Oh, I'm very pleased with that. Um, I don't know how you um, uh, uh, made it through all of that in such good shape. Oh, here's one. I've heard that Creamwood is considering phasing out the IB. No. <laughs> is it true? No, definitely not. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, everybody. Um, and um, I hope that was a, a useful process for you. Um, Oh, here, that's, it's funny, right? Every time I say, oh, no more questions, one more comes in. And Julie, I'm going to put you on screen again because it's another one about um, at what point do we provide girls with support in exploring potential career options? Over to you. OK, thank you. Hoping you can hear me. I can't see that question. However, we do, I guess, start a formal program for students in year 10. At the beginning of year 10, each student undertakes a series of uh, questionnaires and assessments looking at their natural aptitudes across a number of um, areas that may be relevant for different uh, career um, aspirations. They also look at strengths and interests and so on, as well as personality. They, students are, have a report that uh, parents also can have a look at, and that sort of starts the exploration. It's really designed to get students um, excited about considering their future. We conduct work engagement or work experience a week at the end of November in Year 10, where students go out and into the real world 
um, not in their uniforms, but actually participate uh, working in an organisation. And we also follow that up with uh, some CV writing, interview skills, etc. Um, after and reflection after that week. Um, I'm involved in also subject selection uh, for years 11 and 12 as well, just to making sure that students, if they are partic particularly interested in certain areas, that they are, I guess, incorporating subjects that, that may be a prerequisite for certain courses at certain institutions. Um, so I'm involved with that as well. We'd actually like to bring in careers a lot earlier. It should be whole school, it should be right from kindergarten, but uh, there's only one of me at the moment, so I really do focus on 10, 11 and 12, but always, always available for any student or parent who is interested in having that discussion, anything to do with life beyond school in the other years as well. There we go. OK, um, sorry, I'm having great. OK, finally, I'm having technical difficulties. I'm giving up on my earphones. Um, so uh, this question that's come in about, you know, if the overall year group does poorly, do, this, do, do other students get dragged down, particularly if they're, if they're at the top? Really common question, really common fear. So I'm very glad you asked it. And the answer is no. Um, so if I take you back to um, the slide that we were um, talking about um, where I was showing you how they moderate the um, the exam marks against the assessment marks. Remember that if you're um, at the top end, that's going to be the marker. Uh, and you will, as long as that end stays high, then you'll be fine. So what you would need, and this is the, the point about the sort of, it's not down to individual students, it would have to be whole cohorts. What you might be in trouble if, um, you the, the entire cohort you were somewhere in the middle and the entire cohort stopped working um, and then didn't do as well um, but actually that tends not to happen what will happen is the the top students are going to be at the top end and they will continue to perform highly and then in the exam what happens is if those other ones have dropped off what they've done is they've said they've increased the gap so one of the things that the moderation process does is it maintains the gap. If in the assessment process, this was the gap between them, and then they maintain that gap in the exam, it won't change. But if in the assessment process, um, the gap was here, and then in the uh, exam, it opens up, what that'll do is actually drop the assessment marks of the ones that did poorly, but the ones that are high will stay. So because they keep the gap um, in place, they shouldn't be penalised by that. OK, um, great. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. I had so many messages I can see in the Q&A saying we can't hear you. It was a malfunctioning um, uh, earphones thing. Is there astronomy a course? Is astronomy a course at Queenwood? No, it's not. Um, it's not anywhere that as far as I know, if it is, it's a very uncommon course. Um, so I think that's everything. Um, uh, great. Right. Well, I'm not seeing anything else come in. So third time lucky um, <laughs> and we'll bring it to a close. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, and I hope you found it uh, useful. And if there's any further uh, questions at the end of all of this, I'm very happy to um, take that on board. And similarly, I know my colleague um, uh, colleagues will, you know, the experts on curriculum and careers and so on, be very happy to help you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>